Hello and welcome to Containers from the Couch. I'm Justin Garrison and I'm very excited about today's episode. Uh, we are talking all about EKS Anywhere, which just launched bare metal support last week. So now you can deploy EKS Anywhere clusters on bare metal. We got a demo, we got uh, Vipin and Jacob and Chris here with us uh, who all work on the EKS Anywhere team. Uh, so Vipin, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us uh, what you do and, uh, and then we'll go around, say hello. Yep. Hey, everyone. Uh, super excited to be here. My name is Vipin Mohan. I am a principal product manager on the uh, uh, AWS Kubernetes team. It's very closely involved with uh, you know what we're going to be talking about today, about EKS Anywhere on Bare Metal. Super excited to be here. Go ahead, Chris. Good catch that mute button. Hey, I'm Chris, um, software engineer on the team, building out the uh, Bare Metal capability. And what areas did you focus on building? Um, largely around uh, uh, getting the validation for the product up and running um, so that uh, customers don't get a bad experience when they try to provision the cluster during the later stages of provisioning. So um, that was the core area that I focused on and then helping out with all, all other little bits. And Chris also worked with our beta customers. I must call that out. Yeah, lot, lots of interaction with these yep. customers. So if anyone is watching, then yeah. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm on the back end of the email. <laughs> All right, Jacob, how's it going? Good. Uh, excited to be here. Name's Jacob Weinstock. I'm also a software engineer on the EKS Anywhere team. Um, I'm quite new to the team. I came from the Tinkerbell community. I've been working on that project for about two years. Um, so I d definitely focused uh, on the Tinkerbell side and the integrations into uh, EKS Anywhere. Cool, and that leads, us, leads me right into like the stack of EKS Anywhere. Uh, does anyone have a, I, I can try, uh, but does anyone have like a, a rough like this is what's involved, all the open source that's being used to create a cluster on-prem. Because when you're working on-prem, you don't have all the APIs that you get in AWS when you're standing up EKS clusters. We have to bring all that, all that provisioning, all the API, all those control loops into an on-prem environment. So does anyone have a, a, a rough overview of some of the components used? Yeah, I, uh, I can yeah. check it off. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Do yeah. It. No, go VIP and go. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll give my uh, my pitch, and you know, like Jacob, definitely Tinkerbell is a key part. So I, you know, I'd love to hear from you as well. Uh, so EKS Anywhere on bare metal uh, is one workflow that allows you know our customers to do two things primarily. One is you know to provision and bring up the bare metal server itself, and the second part is you know uh, creating and the operating Kubernetes clusters. So with you get one workflow by which you you do both, and Tinkerbell is part of the first workflow, and I'll let Jacob talk more about that. And the cluster lifecycle operations for Kubernetes, for that, you know, we leverage uh, Cluster API, which is a Kubernetes sub-project. And we, our team actually contributed in all of the folks that you see on this call. You know, they contributed to the uh, Cluster API provider for Tinkerbell. Uh, and that's the thing that actually we use under the hood for cluster lifecycle operations. But Jacob, yeah, you are the Tinkerbell expert. <laughs> sure. Um... Yeah, so so the, the the Tinkerbell stack in general is um, yeah, it's a bunch of APIs that that do provide that functionality. That some of the functionality that cl cloud providers give us um, when you want to spin up machines, right? So on a bare metal, the typically you're going to need some way to get an operating system on a node, and so the Tinkerbell stack provides some low level uh, services to do that: DHCP, TFTP, HTTP to get an initial uh, machine net booting get some image on there. And then there are some APIs in the Tinkerbell stack around um, what we call workflows. And a workflow is what allows you to lay down onto a disk um, operating systems with configs and settings and things that you should, uh, you might want on your system. And so we've got some APIs around that. And then 
the last final kind of piece that we do, is, which is optional, um, we have a out of band management or a BMC management um, API. And all of the and so it can interact, turn machines on and off. It can set next boot devices, things of that nature. And so that'll get us in the the flow of getting the machine up and running, and then pass it off to like Vipin said to the cluster API Tinkerbell provider, which then uh, does a lot of the Kubernetes stuff. Yeah, and that's a different workflow than what we had for VMware, because VMware is the other environment where we can run these EKS Anywhere clusters. But that is, in a sense, you're someone else does all the work of standing up a vSphere environment, creating those APIs that we can use. And, and for bare metal, it's just network cables and power. <laughs> That's like the lowest level you can get of like, I plugged in these two cables and that computer should boot now. <laughs> and, and how do you get all of those APIs and everything else running for that environment is very different than yeah what, what we're doing on top of other things that have APIs to create VMs. Uh, vSphere already comes with a you know pixie boot environment on their NICs. So there's a lot of things there that uh, have, have just worked for us in VMware. And now, yeah, the bare metal launch, because especially because we do a full life cycle of pixie booting, installing the OS, provisioning uh, Kubernetes on top of it, uh, is, is definitely a different uh, thing. Yeah, it's it's uh, interesting, right? You you if you if you talk about cluster API, right? They have this idea of providers, and not, if I'm not mistaken, the vast majority of them are APIs that exist somewhere. But we bundle in an entire provider into EKS Anywhere bare metal, which is in and of itself, um, and not only that, kind of dangerous. But it's a bare metal provider, and so you're out in the wild. You're in someone else's data center. You're in someone's home, as we can we're probably going to see here, um, and so. It's uh, it was fun. It was challenging, but yeah, that's the stack, and we literally embed it inside the binary, get it up and running for you, and do all the heavy lifting to create a stable provider that your cluster API can work against. Yeah, for sure. Interestingly, we um, we did go back and forth on whether or not we should deploy Tinkerbell independently, or whether we should bundle it and stuff like that. And we just felt like it was a good idea to to bundle it all. Um, as part of the provisioning process because it made the customer life, customer experience a little bit simpler and they just didn't have to worry about these additional steps ahead of time. So good thing, we think. Uh, we did get a question about bundling Tinkerbell. Uh, why not some of the other provisioners? I mean, there are Metal 3, Ironic, um, Red Hat has Satellite and Foreman. Uh, why did we, we pick Tinkerbell? Was there a technical reason for that? Yeah, I can maybe speak a little bit to it. I don't know if Vipin or Chris have some more um, context around it, but there, one of the reasons I'm I'm familiar with is that so Tinkerbell is a newer project. It, it's under lots of active development and um, contributing to it and influencing the direction and making it better was a little bit um, more. It, it was a it was a trade off that they were willing that the Amazon team was willing to take on a little bit more than a more established project like. Metal 3, Metal Cube, right? That's been around a little bit longer. Um, and not, not only that, but it's written in, um, if I'm not mistaken, it's written in Python and some other languages. Tinkerbell is all written in Go. Uh, the, the team that would be working on this, uh, the team, our team, are more familiar with Go. And so being able to drive the project itself, make the customizations maybe that we wanted to help it work um, and contribute upstream was one of the big advantages that we saw. Yeah, and also to add on to what Jacob just said, you know, like, uh, one of the reasons for choosing Tinkerbell was the composable microservice architecture that Tinkerbell comes with. Um, so it's basically made up of five uh, microservices uh, that make up Tinkerbell. And many of these components are swappable. And that is something that is important for us because we wanted to give customers you know, an opinionated tool set, but they should also be able to like, you know, swap out and use something different if they chose to. So that is another reason for Tinkerbell. And that's a good point, even just from the standard Tinkerbell you know, setup, which has a Postgres database backend, right? That's where you're storing all your machines and you're at your inventory. And for EKS Anywhere, it actually uses a, a Kubernetes backend with CRDs. And so it's a Kubernetes native approach of, hey, we don't really need to rely on these other databases uh, for, especially for the, the bootstrapping uh, service, because you're not bootstrapping thousands of machines or something. Uh, Tinkerbell at scale, I'm sure requires uh, maybe a dedicated database or something else. But uh, for larger scales for bare metal, uh, for some of the needs of EKS Anywhere of bootstrapping, just getting it started, uh, you probably aren't provisioning 
couple hundred machines from your laptop. Um, if you are, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but, but if you're not, uh, the, it, it works great to get you that bootstrap cluster because you can always expand uh, the cluster beyond just getting the control plane running and a few workers running. Uh, there was one other question about doing the similar things for um, Metal as a Service, Canonical's uh, provisioning uh, system. And I think the general answer here is uh, we're Amazon, we're customer obsessed. If customers ask for it, absolutely, we want to help you out with whatever you're using for provisioning. Uh, Tinkerbell was, was for us, was one of the simplest ways to kind of get something embedded and bring a stack to a customer if they don't have pixie booting network infrastructure that already was doing that. So if there's things that you want to do and you say like, hey, I already have mass, I already have a form and I have something else, let us know, uh, reach out, open an issue on the EKS Anywhere uh, repo, which actually I'll, I'll grab a link to here in a second too. Yeah, we, we, we coupled, I maybe I did cover just briefly, but I do want to touch, we did couple um, Tinkerbell with a cluster API provider. And so that was a hard requirement. And I'm not sure if MAS, M-A-S-S, -S, I don't know how you say it, I don't actually know if they have that. So we would have had to write from scratch a new cluster API provider um, to handle that. Um, Metal Cube, I think, has one. And so that one was a closer option, I think. But um, MAS and maybe some of these other services that do kind of bare metal provisioning that don't didn't have cluster API providers, they kind of fell off the list pretty quickly. And let me just show a couple things here uh, with uh, the getting started blog posts. Uh, I wrote this one, um, which is intended to bring you at least an example of the workflow of what it would be like to actually you know, create a cluster. Cy did a great Lightboard video just explaining how EKS Anywhere uh, and EKS are different and where they run, why they you know, were built this way. Um, but in my in this blog post, it's it's probably way too small. At least I can't read it. Um, I go over some of the basics of like uh, how to provision the workflow. Like you need a hardware inventory file. Uh, you're going to create a cluster um, and and just how to install it. So we're going to walk through all of those steps in an actual cluster. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of show off. We do have a blog post out there. Uh, I will post the link here in a second. As well as on the EKS Anywhere docs, uh, we have a full actual, you know, a little more thorough for uh, what you might want for creating a cluster uh, with all the spec examples and everything else for the files and, and getting started. So if you want to run a cluster yourself, if you have bare metal servers, uh, check out the docs too. And let me get both those links real fast. I got to switch two windows to post it. Um, the getting started guide pull in so you can see on video and then the production cluster docs. You also can still run EKS Anywhere on vSphere if you have a vSphere environment and you can run it on a local Docker provider uh, on your laptop. So if you want an EKS Anywhere cluster to test with, to see how it works, to go through the actual flow of creating a cluster, uh, there's also a Docker uh, provider as well to run locally. And there's the docs. So just, oh, I forgot. It doesn't cross post to LinkedIn. Hold on. Uh, I have to, I have to manually do that because this doesn't work. <laughs> there you go. Thanks everyone joining from LinkedIn. Um, it's a, always an experiment to try with some of the LinkedIn stuff. Yeah. That's cool to see. Mm -hmm. There's, right. um, do that we do have some partners too, I think, right. That, that have created some environments to spin you up. I don't know if you've got links. I can send it to you, Justin. There's a Equinix Metal has a nice little repo that you can follow to do their um, EKS Anywhere bare metal tutorial as well. My blog post at the bottom has a ton of partner links, um, awesome. which, are, which is awesome for everyone else that extends it. So um, I think the Equinix Metal here is, is in here, Aqua Perfect. Canonical, uh, a lot of partners have special blog posts or documentation or walkthroughs on if you want to run EKS Anywhere with either their operating system, their hardware in their environments, whatever it is, uh, check out the links at the bottom of my blog because yeah, I, we had a ton of partners that were working with us to make sure that everything was working as, as needed. And I lost my mouse. And yes, Wally uh, Spectro is, is, is definitely on that list. So... <laughs> <laughs> so we're about 15 minutes into the stream. Let's jump into actual cluster creation. Uh, I'll show workflow here. Um, we are going to be using uh, my hardware that I built for this, uh, which is is 
named Kubernetes. Uh, so I, I popped in the video here. Um, you can see it down in the corner. It's literally right behind me on the, on this little table back here. Um, so I might need to, you know, go back and, and turn on some things because I don't have IPMI on that on those devices. Uh, so I sometimes have to actually push a button to <laughs> uh, plug it in or to turn it on. And uh, I have a full blog post on the hardware that I used inside of it uh, that I will also post here um, just because it was a lot of fun to build. Uh, there's still stuff I'm, I'm working on with it uh, just because there's a lot of lights and other things that uh, I was I want to get to show off how EKS Anywhere works. We have a GitOps controller we can show. So there's things in here that is more than just four computers that you can't see because they're hidden in the cube. Um, but for today, we're just going to walk through the basic of let's deploy a cluster and see how everything works. Yeah, Justin spent a few weeks building that uh, setup that you see on the screen. And uh, he's used some 3D printers, lights, a lot of fancy stuff. It it was, it was uh, hardware is hard. <laughs> and I've worked yeah. in a few data centers. <laughs> and I always yeah. forget how much longer uh, building hardware and data centers. I literally spent like an afternoon making ethernet cables. <laughs> I had to remember the, the color code because I needed the exact lengths and I needed really small ends on them to clear the size. And so, yeah, uh, yeah it was it was a lot of fun just to remember how hardware is. Yeah, um, yeah. But also and the that systems. And that handle that you guys see, you know, that one is kind of super important because that helps Justin move, carry it around. <laughs> yeah, if you've never seen the, the old Apple Power Mac G4 Cube, that's what this was built on. It was a case that was just built from that old Apple hardware, I the design of it was amazing. And obviously the name fit yeah. so well. Uh, it was just a matter of like, can I fit four powerful yeah. enough computers inside of this case and not have it catch on fire? And yeah. so far we're good. <laughs> how, how, did you get, I mean, you might be to show this, but did you get far with the LED display and did you start writing custom deployments to fiddle that? The uh, LED display uh, all the way at the bottom. Right now it's only, it's, oh, my mouse keeps not working. Um, so let's go all the way to the bottom. I do have logo lights on the back. The LED display just shows a picture right now. I can show logos. And so I can show it's 32 by 32 bitmaps. <laughs> and and it automatically just like maps it out. So I have a couple different ones that I can cycle through. And yesterday I did have it so that I could uh, create a Kubernetes deployment which would rewrite the picture. So I could create it, I have a container image. I can switch my tag, basically. I have a different tag for different deployments that show different images. And so I did get that working. Uh, it actually mounts the US, the, anyway, the controller has a USB device. It's really cool. I I love the, all the stuff that it can do. Um, I'm not gonna nerd out on that because we wanna show off EKS Anywhere up and running on the cluster. <laughs> uh, but go check Easy out- Easy to the, get carried away. Yeah, go check out the blog post because uh, it, yeah. was, it was a lot of fun. Oh man, and my mouse keeps, I know why actually, because I moved my desktop and the wireless is, it's too far away from the actual mouse. Um, or I have too many things on Wi-Fi here. <laughs> uh, so in the blog post, oh wait, I, let me let me look at comments. Was there anything else? Um, the Mysterious Friend. Uh, yeah, shout out to to my friend, uh, Jamie and Patrick, who made, who laser cut the, uh, um, the acrylic for me because that, that nice. turned out amazing. I'm making sure I didn't miss any comments or questions. Okay, so for the cluster itself, very first thing you need in on-prem is you gotta go plug in everything. <laughs> you have to go plug in, a, build a data center, step one, right? Get power, get network, uh, get cooling, go build a data center, okay? Once you have that done, that's the easy part. <laughs> now, the next thing you need to do is get some inventory from your computers that you wanna run Kubernetes on. And you can pull that information from various places Everybody knows the two things that run data centers are CSV files and or spreadsheets and <laughs> labels. And if you don't have those two things, you can't have a data center. So uh, you may, need to make sure you label everything. Otherwise, everyone will hate you. Um, but if you have those things, then you're, you're ready to go. Labels and, and CSV files. Uh, and, and so I already have that with my cube. And so if I look at my hardware inventory file here. Again, you can pull this from anywhere and just generate it on the fly. You can make a script that does this from if you have an API, something like that. Uh, the bare minimum you need for your hardware inventory file is what's, actually I have one extra field, um, but you need a host name for what the name of the machine is, uh, MAC address, IP address, network information, gateway, netmask, 
and name servers because once the machine starts up, we don't know if you have DHCP on the network. A lot of data centers don't. We don't know if you have static assignments. Um, and then we need a disk to install Kubernetes or, or the operating system on. So you'll need to have a disk. Uh, there's also an optional label here, um, which I have. And this just free form labels. So you can assign different machines to different roles. And I just label these workers and control plane. So I have one control plane node uh, and, and three workers, not highly available. Etcd will be installed on my control plane, Kubernetes API, scheduler, uh, controller manager. Those are all on the control plane on, on the, the uh, nice, the up server. Um, cause this is never going to give you up a uh, cluster. And so up is my API server. Cause it should always stay up. And, uh, so yeah, everything control plane wise will install on this one machine. No workloads will schedule there. So all the workloads will go to the other three nodes. Yeah. Maybe real quick too. Um, this, uh, we are installing Kubernetes and we use this term labels, but this unfortunately doesn't propagate down to node labels. Um, so just FYI, when you are using this, this is a construct we use internally for mapping things and it doesn't make it that far. Right. This is just for the provisioning side of it in inventory for Tinkerbell um, to create those. Um, and there are other options. If you go to the full docs, you'll see IPMI settings. So you can actually have uh, EKS anywhere boot the machines for you, actually power cycle the entire machine, make sure that everything is is running as need be. In my case, again, I don't have IPMI on these boards. Uh, I do have out of, I have wake on LAN, <laughs> um, but that's not really a full power management that just like sends those packets on the network. Yeah. Uh, and Wally was asking if Tinkerbell would help with node Mac discovery. Yeah, that's a good question. Um... The current answer is no. At the moment, there is no kind of discovery inside of Tinkerbell itself, um, but that is a roadmap item or a discussion topic that has been brought up in the Tinkerbell community, and hopefully uh, in the future we'll have something like that. Pro probably a good time to call out that Jacob and I both made painters on the Tinkerbell project as well. So, um, yeah, we're, we're contributing to that roadmap quite heavily. And then one other question here from Andrew about uh, running EKS Anywhere bare metal for edge deployments, uh, Intel Nux and Raspberry Pis. Yeah, so one of the uh, things is uh, Intel we... Nux, I'm... It's... sorry, go ahead, Chris. Nope, you crack on, you're good. Yeah, yeah, so Intel Nux is supported. I believe Micah on our team was playing around with that uh, some time back. Uh, Raspberry Pi, because it's running on an ARM processor, that's not something we support right now, but it is something we're looking into. I'd, I'd add real quick too, um, we are deploying Kubernetes. So when you think about um, the machines you have, you also want to think about is Kubernetes suited for those machines, right? Some of these tiny little Raspberry Pis as a, you can use them, but just FYI, like you might not be able to do much once you get Kubernetes because you need all of the kubelet and things running. So just keep that in mind too. There's nothing particularly special, I'd so to speak, about um, the Kubernetes distros are running in terms of resource consumption. General upstream guidelines, if not mistaken, is what, what you would want to look at as well. There's also the concern about high availability. If you are at an edge device and you, you know, if you need a highly available etcd database, highly available API server, you're looking at three etcd nodes and two uh, API servers at minimum. And so you'll you'll want five machines just for the control plane if this is an environment where it's like, oh, this can't go down. Uh, we need this up. This is high, highly available uh, for smaller environments. You know, if you're if you're doing what I'm doing and you have one backend, um, I I don't have an SLA for, <laughs> for my my Kubernetes cluster, so uh, I'm fine with that. But but if you're running you know workloads that do need to be highly available, the workload the worker nodes can stay available. You know, the workloads uh, can spread between the machines, but not if the API server is down. They won't reschedule. If a node goes down, you you lose some of that functionality. So um, this is you know a, a professional or a, you know a enterprise grade system for people that want to run full you know SLA enabled workloads, and we want to help with that. So um, that's just another thing we call out. If you want to play with it at home, I love getting old enterprise desktops. Go eBay, places that have, you know, you can get like uh, HP, Dell, Lenovo, all have these enterprise desktops that'll have eight gigs of memory, a Core i5, Core i7, you know, 
CPU and 100 gigs of uh, storage, and the machines will be you know 100 to 200 dollars, and so you can build a five node cluster for easily under a thousand dollars. They're all used. Um, I used to do that all the time. I, I would go through Craigslist and just cycle through and upgrade my clusters at home. So, great question. Last thing I'm, I'll note, just because you you did bring up specific um, you know manufacturers of hardware, one thing that I believe it's in our doc somewhere, we do have a list of specific hardware that we do we've we've validated on. Um, obviously, the hardware can be lots of different things. Your firmware versions, your NIC versions, you know, you name it. All of these different things can be different, and so not everything is supported because that's. That's tough, but if you use something and you find that it doesn't work, we'd love to support it. So let us know. Please do reach out, and we can talk about how we can get it up and running um, and make sure that things work on lots of variety of things. So. Yeah, so the approach we've taken here is you know, to provide a minimum set of requirements, like Justin was talking about, 8 gig RAM, you know, two CPUs. Uh, and our, uh, you know, what, we, what we feel is that you know, any hardware that meets uh, those generic requirements should be fine for running EKS anywhere on bare metal. We've tested both in our uh, lab environment as well as through a bunch of you know like uh, uh, customer engagements that we've had, uh, as well as partner engagements. Uh, so try it out. And if, if you run into any issues, like let us know, like Jacob said. Here, I just posted the validated hardware for everyone to go to in the docs. And That's yeah, cool. it's, it's hardware is a matrix of BIOS versions and firmware and all, all different things that even as I was discovering on my uh, small cluster uh, mattered. <laughs> so uh, so back to provision and cluster, you have a hardware inventory file. The next thing you need is actually a cluster spec of what is EKS Any we're going to use to deploy the cluster. And so we everything is behind the EKS control uh, command line, if I spell it right. Um, there is a anywhere subcommand. So once you install it, you get EKS control anywhere, which does all of the provisioners for all of our uh, supported provisioners, vSphere and, and bare metal right now. You can, you know, just sample output here of um, what we're going to get. And so if I do a generate, generate uh, cluster config, And I need to provide a provisioner string, which is, again, it's where you're going to deploy the cluster. So if you want vSphere or bare metal um, or, or Tinkerbell in this case. Uh... Oh, and I need a name. I forgot the name. Uh, so that spits out a config to standard output. So you can save, you'll obviously want to save this file and modify a couple things in here. And the main things are the only things you actually need are you're going to need an IP address that's available on your network. And this is used for the Kubernetes API endpoint. This is not an IP address of one of your machines. This is just a floating IP address that's not being used. Uh, EKS Anywhere takes care of presenting that IP address on your network once the control plane's ready. Uh, you can set your version of Kubernetes you're going to use. Uh, I think for bare metal, is it only 122 right now? Or is 121 also supported? We support 122, 121, and 120. Uh, okay. Yep. So anything that EKS distro, our upstream Kubernetes exactly. is supporting. Yep. And then the, the other thing you need here is a Tinkerbell IP. So once we create our bootstrap cluster, everything kind of shifts over to the final cluster that we build. And it's going to move the Tinkerbell stack with it. And so there's going to be another IP address that Tinkerbell's running on because you need an IP address that other machines can pixie boot to. So if you're adding new, new machines, if you're creating new clusters, you need a Tinkerbell stack available. For the bootstrap process, it runs everything on my laptop. And so I get a kind cluster that puts all this stuff in there. I'm not using that, that Kubernetes IP. I'm not using that Tinkerbell P IP at first. I use those once I get the workload cluster available. Uh, and then you can add things like uh, SSH keys, um, what operating system you want. By default, it's Bottle Rockets, uh, but we also support Ubuntu um, and a few other things. So I'm going to show you my cluster config uh, for this cluster, which is most of that stuff. I get an IP address here on my network. I'm naming the cluster Kubernetes, of course. Um, I'm also, and I have I have one 
control plane node, like I said, and three uh, worker nodes. I'm also caching my uh, assets. So the OS image and all the Tinkerbell uh, RAM disk uh, that we need to actually bootstrap the machines, I'm caching those locally on my network. So I don't have to pull them from S3 uh, just because I, if you want to be in a disconnected environment, if you don't have internet access, you can totally do that. Uh, I'm doing it right here. I have this folder. I'm serving a Python web server. That's all I did. <laughs> I ran the Python command. I have the files in this directory and, and then it's serving those files uh, from my IP address on my desktop. Uh, you also do need your admin machine on the same network as, as the machines you're provisioning because you have to actually talk to them. So it's going to pixie boot from my machine running a Tinkerbell stack. And this is like full layer two. So yeah, FYI. Yeah. Uh, I also changed my OS to Ubuntu. I added my uh, public key and I added that hardware selector for the labels. So I know that any machine that has, is type worker is gonna use this uh, configuration for the machine config. So you have different machine configs that can do control plane. If you wanna do different operating systems, different SSH keys, whatever it is you want that's separate between the machines. So that's my full config. I used the generator. I added a handful of things for things that were unique to my, my cluster. I know we're getting to it. We're getting to it. <laughs> uh, lose my mouse again. Uh, actually, you want to remove the old folder of generated information. Uh, and as you can see, I have, oh, and I don't need that. So I have my init RAM, I have VM. Linux and which is compressed uh, disk, and then I have the Ubuntu image. Uh, I don't need to force it. So when we create the cluster, I need to use that config, and I need to use my hardware CSV. That's it. I have those two files that I edited. Everything else is is going to be created here with the cluster. We're going to start that process. Chris. Yeah. Do you want to walk through what's happening? Sure. Uh, uh, right now, we're going to go ahead and look at all the data you've given us and start validating and making sure that we have sufficient hardware um, specified in that CSV file, uh, making sure that doing some soft checks to make sure like IP addresses and whatnot that you've configured um, are being used, being used by something else on the network. Um, once we've gone through all of that, we then create a temporary cluster, what we refer to as the bootstrap cluster. That goes ahead and uh, has all of the, the cluster API components installed on it, along with um, the hardware uh, in a Kubernetes CRD form installed on it that we use to represent the physical kit in the back end. It has Tinkerbell put on it. Um, most of Tinkerbell, I should say, uh, installed on it as well. One component does get launched as a separate container, a bit of an implementation detail, but that's to do with the layer two networking Jacob was referencing uh, so that we can we can um, get the DHCP traffic. And uh, yeah, once that's up and running, we then go ahead and begin, Cappy begins the provisioning process. Um, I'll probably hold it there because it'll take a minute for that to, for that to come up. It does take a few, few minutes, I think. I don't know what the average is. I don't know if we timed an average, but probably three or four minutes before it gets into the, the core provisioning part. Yeah, so I have this, uh, this container's running locally. This is that kind cluster. Um, I can even uh, see the cluster, uh, right? If I'm using kind, because it's using a kind cluster under the, under the covers. And then that boots uh, container is going to run for the actual pixie booting for layer two, which is attaching to my network interface on my machine. Um, that's probably already running. There it is. Um, so I have the, the boots container and I have the kind container uh, are the two things running. One gives me a cluster or a Kubernetes API that I can install cluster API. And the other one, yeah, gives, is giving me pixie booting abilities. Yeah, one thing to note, um, the EKS, to, to run this, what we're calling, uh, where he's running this, we, we I think in the docs refer to this as an administration node. 
and for the bare metal specific only for the bare metal provider um and because we're doing layer two traffic this won't work on if you're using docker for desktop for mac so just fyi if you wanted to run this that's unfortunately not supported because we can't get a layer two inside of docker desktop for mac on your on like a bridge network so you got to run it on a linux machine it could be a vm on your uh mac that has a bridge network but just kind of fyi yeah that's a good point because yeah the Docker desktop is still running a container on a VM on your machine and, and connecting that network is, is still netted behind your. Correct. Yeah, Justin, there's a question about why you had to specify the SSH key. I believe that's because you used Ubuntu instead of Bottle Rocket, right? Uh, whoops, I, I missed it. Well, yeah, uh, for Bottle Rocket, in, there is a config, right, to turn on the SSH uh, the admin container on Bottle Rocket, right? I don't remember if that was in the cluster config or if a way a way for us to turn that on for Bottle Rockets. Uh, with Ubuntu, the SSH key is just there by default. But is there configuration to enable SSH on Bottle Rocket? Yeah, I think by default, uh, SSH is turned on in Bottle Rocket if you don't mess with any of the settings. So in, in Bottle Rocket, we have old shows about it. If you're not familiar with it, it's a highly secure container specific OS. And so your SSH doesn't run as a host service. It runs as another container. So it runs an admin container on the OS and you SSH into that container. And then you can do admin type things and you can kind of uh, shift yourself to the host itself, uh, but you don't actually ever SSH to the, the actual host operating system that's running. Uh, so here in the cluster process, we're at creating a new workload cluster. So everything is ready for me to actually power on the machines. Uh, but I wanna go slow with the very first one, just so we can show you what all is in place inside this cluster before we actually uh, are turning it on. Here's uh, the boots container, and it's just sitting on my network, waiting for one of the four MAC addresses that I told it, hey, look for these MAC addresses. If any of them connect to the network, you're the DHCP for that machine. And then you should respond and you should take over any DHCP responsibilities only for those four MAC addresses. Everything else on my network is still fine working, relying on my my you know standard DHCP server uh, and boot process. So it's not interfering with anything except for the things in inventory. Over here, if I uh, look at generated. Here's my kind. So I'm exporting a cube config for the kind cluster that's running on my machine right now. And I can, I'll see one node because this is just a kind cluster. Uh, but the cool thing here is I can get uh, machines. All of those, all of that inventory that I created is now in inside of Kubernetes running locally as CRDs. And you can see here, I have one in, in a provisioning state. And this is the actual control plane node. The other ones are, oh, mouse, stop it, are pending state. So if I boot the other machines, they'll boot up, they'll still pixie boot, but they'll just wait. They're not gonna do anything until the control plane's ready. So we're gonna get the control plane up and running first. Once the control plane's running, then we can go in parallel with everything else. We can just say, okay, now everything else, go ahead and boot and download and, and provision yourselves. But we wanna make sure the Kubernetes API is up and healthy first before we continue on. I also can get the... Um, Workflows, uh, which uh, Chris was mentioning earlier, I think it was Jacob, Chris, I don't remember. Uh, the Tinkerbell has workflows that it follows through. You can customize those, it's in the docs if you wanna add steps to it and say like, oh, I need you to configure a file or install a package or something. That workflow is just a standard step of do this thing, then do the next. And so I can actually describe it. Again, these are all just standard Kubernetes CRDs, uh, but this is how Tinkerbell works outside of Kubernetes as well. Yeah, one thing to note while, while you're ringing up this, um, the, the Tinkerbell concept of installing an operating system is one of the things that I quite like about it. Um, if my background, data center operations, sysadmin engineer stuff, you're uh, very familiar with kickstart files and upstart things. And while those were great and they worked well and Cobbler had all the kind of integration for those types of things, I never liked this idea where I had to write a script that was like backspace, 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 and then, you know, write a file. Like, 
I was never a big fan of it. It worked. It, it could be reliable-ish at times, but I was never a fan of it. So Tinkerbell, they, they created this new concept here where you're looking at where you can define how you install an operating system um, through discrete um, functionality. And we call that a template. And you see there's actions inside of a template. And each of these are just container images that do a specific thing. So you'll see in this first one, you've got like environment, Im or you got image URL and we're just pulling down um, an image, a raw image, and we're actually just going to stream it to disk. And then you can go and do other very high, more high level things than saying like, I'm going to interact with your console and use your operating system specific auto installer, right? You know, to do this stuff, I can just uh, spin this up like you would a rescue disk and you can just write everything out. And so that's one of the concepts in Tinkerbell that I, I quite like about it. Something, something else that just called out, Tinkerbell, I think we touched on earlier, didn't originally have the Kubernetes backend where uh, it's using all these CRDs and stuff. One of the motivations for that was that it's probably a lot more of a native experience or a familiar experience if you're using Kubectl, um, uh, for using Kubectl to interact with Tinkerbell. So that was at least one of the motivations to go ahead and use Kubernetes as the data source, um, some other technical reasons as well. But uh, that hopefully then brings about you know, you know, that more familiar experience. Yeah, and as part of this project, we actually cubified some of the components. Uh, so we essentially what we did was, uh, you know, making the the uh, the Rufio is a service that we actually developed. Uh, so it's, a, it's now running as a Kubernetes controller uh, within within the cluster. Uh, Boots is also uh, something that you know we worked with, uh, and essentially we cubified the entire architecture and struck uh, components of. Um, of Tinkerbell. And uh, Justin, there was a question on monitoring and logging yeah. being bundled. Yeah. So uh, we announced something called EKS Anywhere Curated Packages back in May, so a couple months back. And uh, that, as part of that uh, framework, we want to you know bring additional tooling, including monitoring and logging. Right now, we've uh, announced uh, a, a container registry for Harbor and looking to add more tooling to that framework. Uh, and this is just an uh, example of what's running in the kind cluster again. We have uh, Cappy, which is cluster API. Uh, we have CapT, which is the, cluster, the Tinkerbell uh, cluster API controller. Uh, we have the Tinkerbell components here, uh, Tink controller, Tink server, uh, Rufio, that was just mentioned, uh, Hegel as metadata service. So if you're not familiar with the entire stack of booting everything, uh, it's all running right here. This is, we pull down those yeah. containers and, and we run them for you so you don't have to worry about it. And that's like the benefit here of like, if you want to do this manually, if you want to go ahead and, and create a Tinkerbell stack, if you want to create Kubernetes, like you can do all those things in EKS Anywhere. It's all just bundled for you. We're running it all to bootstrap it for you. And then once the cluster is up, we pivot all of these management containers over to that workload cluster so that you don't have to worry about like, oh, I need to, Bootstrap it again. It's like, no, it's running for you. Now you can use that as a management cluster. Actually, bare metal is not a management cluster today, uh, but vSphere uh, is. But we're working on management cluster for bare metal too, so everything can bootstrap back to that first cluster you create. So I think I'm ready. Uh, let's go ahead and turn on. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. Let's get just so that we can see the machine boots. Yeah. I, I hope that I have everything set up on the network uh, properly for the for the box. Um, but again, my BIOS always reset my boot order. So let's power it on. Exciting. Live demos. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're really doing it live today. And then what I'm going to do here is... Uh, I'm going to boot this one first because it's my control plane. And so we'll just get that up and running. Uh, so I can wake on land, command line tool. Hopefully it's going to work. Set the magic. I love that it's called a magic packet. <laughs> so is okay. this... And I have to look this... inside to see if it turned on because there's a light inside. So I did get one machine that turned on. So, uh, the magic packet wasn't working on this network earlier today. Uh, so, so far, so good. It, so is this... Um... Edge data center or your main data center, what would you consider this uh, deployment here? If it's in my house, it's my main data center, but it's also meant okay. to be portable, so it's Edge. Yeah. I don't know. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh, nice. Hi hybrid. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
so I don't, I wish I actually had out of band console. Um, and I just found this morning in my BIOS, I have a way to redirect my console. So I probably can connect to it in the future, which is a really cool feature of this, but they also have Intel AMT, but I don't have it plugged in. If I want to plug in the other monitor, I'd have to use my phone and just like show you the, how, how it's working. But that's not super important because we can actually see the workflow happening inside of Kubernetes itself. So we can see Tinkerbell working. Um, I'm hoping that I'm going to see this actually kick in and say, hey, I'm pixie booting something because as the machine sends a pixie boot request, boots will respond and I'll start seeing some of the stuff happen. And and that's kind of a, I don't know, an indicator that, yeah, it's, it's, it's working. If not, if it, if it goes for a couple minutes and I don't see a boot, uh, then I'll have to plug in a monitor. Thank you. Might, might be worth talking through uh, what happens during the very early provisioning process, but uh, Jacob's the expert around that. So maybe Jacob, you talk to some of the DHCP stuff and the uh, Pixie booting question, and what we're doing. Yeah, one other question here uh, about the container runtime. Uh, in both cases, uh, Bottle Rocket or Ubuntu, we're, we're using Containerd. So we're already, there's no Docker running on the nodes themselves. Uh, so it's yeah up and running, ready for Kubernetes 124 and beyond. There was another question I think I saw around why cluster API? Uh, I saw this one first for sure. bringing different network overlays, if anyone wants to mention that. Uh, that's a good question. I, I think, I don't think we have that at the moment. If I'm not mistaken, uh, by default, we use Cilium. Please, Vip and Chris, yeah, correct yeah. me, Justin, if I'm wrong. I can take that one. So yeah, uh, so by default, you know, uh, EKS Anywhere comes bundled with uh, Cilium, which is default CNI. Uh, we've also, uh, you know, published some documentation on how you could use Multus for your overlay, uh, configuring your overlay networking, and we're looking to improve that experience. But as of today, if you want to try out Multus, you know, there's documentation that's available. You can take, you can try it out. Uh, Calico is not something that we bundle, but uh, given that you know all of the EKS anywhere components are open source, you are free to swap out, uh, you know, a CNI and use Calico if that's that's what you'd want to go with. I think there's another part to that question. Can you integrate with Vault and Argo CD? Yeah. Uh, so GitOps, we are bundling Flux, uh, but again, you're free to swap it with Argo CD. And for secrets management, uh, is it's going to be something we're thinking about in terms of our curated packages framework. Uh, but as of now, given it's open source, you can still use Vault with um, with with EKS anywhere. I don't see anything booting. I'm gonna I'm gonna plug in a monitor, but I also will lose my second screen. So. Um, I'm going to unplug a couple things so I can get to the boot menu of that device. But we're yeah, going to get just, it. Yep. Yeah, while he's doing that, um, it looks like, uh, I apologize for your name, Gokul. You brought up a great point. Um, Docker, there was a the talk about container runtime. Um, Docker is the is requirement for what we're calling the EKS admin administration node. But it's it's definitely not like Justin was saying. It's um, it's it's not needed for any of the Kubernetes deployments, uh, clusters, etc. That will, all, if I'm not mistaken, just be using uh, Containerd. So thanks for pointing that out, Goku. Cool. And then there was uh, while he's doing that real quick. I think there was another question about. Um, it says what container run? T uh, no, excuse me. Cluster API requires an extra admin cluster created. Why does EKS Anywhere integrate with cluster API? And I think that's a great question. Yeah, so I mean, we, we decided to go with cluster API because it's it's open source, it's a, you know, a Kubernetes sub project, and it's also a standard in terms of like, you know, how uh, you can manage your cluster lifecycle operations. It also gives us the ability to, you know, uh, extend it to other uh, infrastructure. You know, right now we have vSphere. We 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 announced bare metal support recently, but in the future, you know, given that EKS anywhere is open source, you know, you uh, any uh, if a customer you know has a provider a cluster API provider, they can plug it in into the EKS anywhere uh, you know, uh, tooling and basically use EKS anywhere to run Kubernetes clusters on any uh, infrastructure that they're using. So it gives us that pluggable framework that we can build in the future. 
Okay, I got my pixie booty. All nice. right. It's a second, it's a second monitor, but I'm going to cancel it because I just realized you can't see it on the power cable. One of my wires came out oh. and it's crimped <laughs> in there. And so I just lost power on a mm -hmm. node. I don't know which node it is though, because I don't have it completely mapped. I'm going to drop this down to a two node cluster and we're going to make it work with at least two of the nodes. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to cancel this, this provisioning because again, I have a tool to re I saw the wire was working its way loose. Data centers are fun, right? Yep. Uh, I saw the wire coming loose, but I don't have a tool to actually pull it out of the Molex connector. It's coming today yeah. in the mail. Uh. Um, so I'm going to cancel this, and then uh, we're going to start this process again with a with a two node. Uh, Roll shooting is always fun, uh, but again, I don't know which node it is. So let me see if I can figure out which node boots. Yeah. There was another question. Um, is multi-cluster management supported by a cluster API? What is the question, Chris? Multi-cluster management? Is multi-cluster uh, management supported by a cluster, cluster API? So I, I don't know if it's, uh, I mean, you could do it through cluster API. You could use the cluster API framework to do it. Uh, but we are investigating different options internally to see you know, what's the best way to deliver a multi-cluster management experience. And management itself can mean different things to different people. Uh, so we are trying to like define all of that uh, and figure out you know, like what that experience would look like for customers. OK. You see the screen still? Yeah, there it is. OK. Yeah, yeah we can see it. Uh, sorry. Let's let's troubleshoot this because this is this is the whole fun of data centers, right? So we're gonna say this is just a two-node cluster now. I got one control plane, one worker. Um, it'll be fine. And I did find let's yep hardware to hardware two. And my other machine is so one up came up. Holding, holding true to its name, uh, and give you is the other machine that turns on. So we're just gonna remove never gonna. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The control plane comes up first. That's why up probably came up. I mean, with the power, because I don't know which oh, which machine had lost power uh, just now. So let's remove all my containers. I mean. On the plus side, my internet hasn't failed, which was a risk today. So <laughs> let's go ahead and create a cluster again. Let's hardware two. Again, I have two nodes in in this hardware inventory, one control plane, one worker node. Um, it'll start again. Let me turn off the machine. I have the second machine waiting already at a pixie boot or at a net boot uh, screen. So I can I can just go to it and tell it, hey, we I want you to pixie boot. Once boots is ready, um, and we can see that it's creating a new bootstrap. Once it gets to create a new workload cluster, that's when I know that Tinkerbell and Boots are ready to receive machines booting from them. If you try to go too early, Boots isn't ready or there's no workflow. So Tinkerbell doesn't know to, to actually sit and wait in a pending state. So once that comes up, then I'll go ahead and power on the machines again. We need to take an item away from this to get rid of that double warning. <laughs> What's that doing there? <laughs> Gotta push F5. <laughs> but wait for the monitor over here, push F5 over here, because I don't have a long enough USB cable or a wireless keyboard. Uh, Justin, how much do you charge for all hands um, services? I could use some of that at my place too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a pretty good button pusher. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Is, is this that workload yet? No, installing cluster API providers. We're almost there. So again, if I go back to uh, yeah. this screen, Oh, 
No machines yet. So he's Tinkerbell still bootstrapping. Yeah. If I look at my my pods, I'll probably have some of them still pending. Uh, yeah, here's creating Tinkerbell containers. Um, so we're still waiting for the Tinkerbell stack inside Kind to boot up, and then we'll be ready once we again once once I see that output every time I know uh, creating workload cluster, we're ready to go. And this is where IPMI helps. If you have IPMI, you don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't run your data center without uh, out-of-band management. Uh, there is um, uh, Redfish is supported as well. Um, maybe not as heavily tested, but uh, if you have Redfish, it should work as well. So. Yep. Just on the note of out-of-band management, I think we, uh, I mean, we might have touched on it, but yeah, people have feedback around how they are de dealing with out-of-band management, uh, any security requirements, anything like that. We'd love to hear it. We're trying to gather use cases around that because we really want to make sure we provide um, necessary flexibility uh, for, for different setups. All right, let's go back to, where's my, oops. Oh, it's already booting. Um, it's already, I already got network requests from the sec from up uh, my API server. Uh, it's already coming in. We'll see it go through the full cycle here. And the other fun thing is because I'm hosting the files locally, I see it request those files as it, as it's requesting Ooh. each one, it's like, oh, hey, this is where I'm at. This is the boot stage. Again, it's just another indicator for me uh, without having a monitor plugged into it always what stage each machine's at. Uh, I, and I can also see what IP address and I, Static IP addresses, I know which machines, which IP. That's probably something worth noting as well. We're talking about DHCP, but then we're also talking about static IPs. So uh, the way Tinkerbell works is it's kind of like IP reservation, um, where you are defining an IP that you want to assign a particular MAC address uh, but it's just getting that IP via the HCP. Yeah, the I don't know if this is official terminology, but the terminology that I'm I'm used to is a uh, in DHCP you can have a host reservation, and so the boots container that does our DHCP for us in Tinkerbell stack, it's all host reservations. Uh, so it doesn't do any uh, lease pools, where it'll just hand out addresses to unknown Macs. It's always known Macs two mm -hmm. specific IPs, a host reservation. Uh, so I see here my control plane node is already pulling, already pulled down the OS image. Uh, the, the final indicator for me that things are working is I'll hear it post because it'll reboot and I'll hear the post beep um, when the first one goes. My worker node, I just booted up to netboot. And so I see it fetching the initial RAM disk uh, for Tinkerbell and Linux Kit. So once I see the worker node at this stage, basically, I know it's coming up as well. Because right now it could just go into a state and wait until the control plane's ready. It's not going to provision anything because we want to make sure inside of EKS Anywhere, you're not going to spin up a bunch of workers before the control plane's ready. <laughs> we want the Kubernetes API before anything else. Mm -hmm. I just heard so a post beep. I don't know if you nice. can hear it. I could yeah, hear it, yes. I heard it. Uh, maybe I can talk briefly about um, what's going on in the Tinkerbell stack right now on the control plane. Um, the Tinkerbell stack has this idea of a in-memory operating system. In, uh, we call it um, Hook. And it's, it's built off of Linux Kit. It's um, just kind of a bare bones machine, Linux machine that will get initially uh, provisioned on your on your box so those that init ram fs and that kernel that vm linux that you saw were serving uh, justin was serving that's what we call hook again it's just a linux kit um, uh, operating system so that gets initially um, loaded into memory on your machine and then from there we a a container gets spun up that has what's called a tink worker and this tink worker will go and talk out to a tink server and ask for workflows to run. And once it has a workflow to run, it'll start doing it. And a workflow, if you remember again, is just how you install an operating system. And so 
the control plane here is is booting up it pulled down those initial images it um, booted into them started the, the hook operating system started up a linux container for or, um, uh, operating system Linux container for uh, the Tink Worker and then sat there waiting to see when it had a job. And we can see here my my first box up. Uh, it doesn't get a node name until it's provisioned, but it's fully provisioned and now it's running. So I actually have the control plane node started up, it booted, it provisioned, and it, it connected back to say, like, yes, I'm here and I'm running. Uh, so we should see here, yep, there's my my worker node is already pulling down its OS image. So it automatically, once the API server was available, all of the other nodes can go through their workflows. The other workflows get created and, and we're ready to go. Um, where, where did that go? There it is. So if I look at those workflows, I can see I got a success on my control plane because it created that already and I'm running for my worker workflow node. for the other machines. And I still have a monitor plugged into that one. It looks like it's turning off right now. So it'll reboot in just a second, and then I'll actually have a full cluster. Nice. So and when I, I, I did find a pretty big difference when I host the machine, the images locally. The Ubuntu image, I think, is like two gigs. And pulling two gigs from the internet isn't terrible. Uh, but when you pull it from a LAN, it's just super fast. It just can go right to disk. And I think the, really, the um, image to disk uh, tool that's used inside of Tinkerbell is really cool. It just takes a raw image and just like spits the bits right on disk yep. as fast as possible. Um, other operating systems sometimes will have like a full OS environment and then they kind of go through like this, uh, you know, chiroot sort of like install process. Uh, it's, it's really fancy how those other ones work. I like this one where it's just like, yeah, just give me bits and I'm going to put them on <laughs> into a SSD or something. The final stage of EKS Anywhere, once this machine boots, I just heard it post, so it's going to come up, create its SSH key, and then join the cluster. Uh, the final stage we'll see here in EKS Anywhere is actually, hey, now we're going to install the CNI, which I know was mentioned earlier, because before we actually get the cluster up, we don't have anything else to run on it. Uh, we will have, I can probably export, um, let's see. I have a cube config already, so I could export that. And I can see my, they're not ready because I don't have uh, CNI running. I can't actually run jobs on them. And that's where we're going to send this overlay or this uh, not ready state until we get the initial stuff working. Um, EKS Anywhere also will pivot all of those workloads from the kind cluster, deploy them over to my workload cluster so that workload cluster can self-manage itself with cluster API. So that's where we see we get the uh, networking workload and cluster API providers over to the workload cluster. Uh, do we have any limitation on the number of workers it can support? I don't believe we have any limitations. It's basically like, you know, the number of uh, the size of the data center and Kubernetes uh, native limitations. I believe it's 5,000 nodes right now. Is that right, Jacob? Yeah, Chris is nodding. Yes. Yeah, 5,000. Seven. Sounds about right. I think it's I think it's about five thousand. I think that's the inbuilt Kubernetes cap. Yeah. Although, yeah, I'm not sure we've had enough hardware to test that yet. Yeah, we haven't tested <laughs> it, but uh... right, but that's a general it's... Kubernetes uh, yeah. upper bounds of yeah. what they test for the API server for responsiveness. And so the SLA for Kubernetes API server is five thousand nodes or there's a number of pods as well and if you're running bare metal you probably have much bigger nodes so you're fitting more pods on them uh, so you'll probably hit the pod limit before you hit the node limits in a lot of cases now how about the multi-tenancy concept for tinkerbell workflows yeah i'm not sure uh i'm not sure if i follow exactly what that means multi-tenancy i'm assuming i'm assuming the ability to like deploy multiple things with the Tinkerbell cluster. Or, you know, I have Tinkerbell running. Can I reuse that? Can I deploy multiple clusters using the same stack? That was my guess. Oh, um, yeah, it, that would make sense. Yeah, there's so there's nothing. Uh, once the Tinkerbell stack is up and running there, 
you can go to there, you can go to the tinkerbell.org and you can check out how to interact with your cluster and, and you can use Tinkerbell kind of standalone and, and uh, there wouldn't be anything to stop you from creating your own custom workflows and um, spinning up other types of things. I don't know if that captures this idea of um, multi-tenancy, but uh, yeah, a workflow also can be anything you need it to be as well. Um, but if you're talking about within a single workflow, can you have multiple tenants doing different things? Um, I don't know if I fully understand that use case per se. There's a... another follow-up, I think. Suppose I have 50 egress IPs, so do we need 50 ports on bare metal? 50 egress IPs. Um, these would all go out through separate networks. Well, so I'm wondering if this is related to um, ingress controller type things, if the egress is from that. I don't know. I would to... love to follow up. I, yeah. I think this would be a great discussion. Uh, do we have a place that people can ask these questions? That's you know a good place for community, either GitHub or Slack or something like that. Yeah, I think the GitHub repo would be a great place. Um, so I think Justin, you put the link on earlier, right? So we have. The yeah, I had it here. earlier. Let me repost it. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, if if you have a use case uh, that's specific for bare metal, we'd love to hear about it and see um, how we'd recommend. We can also add discussions there. Oh, yeah. I see that came from LinkedIn though. So let me cross post it to LinkedIn. Hold on. Yeah, and we also have a uh, Slack channel on the Kubernetes uh, Slack workspace. So feel free to reach out to us there as well. So my, my cluster did provision properly. Yeah, I saw here. that. Nice. Uh, we got everything. Bootstrap cluster got deleted. Everything moved over to the other cluster. Uh, I would I did want to show how inside the cluster itself, this is my my kubeconfig file. I'm using this 10.10.150 IP address. And again, nothing on my network actually owns that IP address uh, except for kubevip, which is running in the cluster. Um, so kubevip is something that we do run by defaults in the in EKS Anywhere bare metal clusters and well, and vSphere clusters, which give you this floating IP address. So if you have high available clusters, if I have multiple worker nodes, this IP address will float with those with those nodes for the control plane. And so that's what's actually serving this 1.50 address for me, not an actual machine. And so I can still hit the Kubernetes API because when I broadcast a message on the on ARP and say, hey, who owns this IP address? Uh, KubeVip responds, like, it's over here. <laughs> and, and all the traffic comes to it. So it's it's a really nice way to give you high availability without actually requiring a physical load balancer or something in front of the cluster to load balance between the nodes. KubeVip can just float that IP address on the, on the network. But that's... That's the entire like stack, everything running. I, I don't. I do have some example workloads, but we all know how what it looks like to install workloads to Kubernetes. Um, we can install a metric server. I know that was asked earlier. Like Grafana, whole networking stack. This is just Kubernetes at this point. We have a Kubernetes API. Everything you would normally get with Kubernetes, you get now. Uh, I have an admin, you know, cube config that I can do all of my maintenance with it. But if you want to hand out access to other people, uh, you know, other developers or something. You can have RBAC, you can install with SSO so that they can have um, authentication with, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of URSA, but what's the actual, uh, OIDC, that's the that's the piece that we need. So if you want auth authentication through OIDC, all of that stuff can be configured during cluster provisioning and then also uh, used in the cluster after the fact. Yeah, this was a cool, awesome demo, Justin. Um, what I liked was, you know, there's some real-time troubleshooting, which is what really would happen in real life. So it was good that you worked through that and uh, got the cluster up and running. Yeah, those are always the uh, the things people like to That's see. That's the interesting and, part, yeah. <laughs> and and when, you know, I, I can't promise that, like, your power won't disconnect like mine did. <laughs> um, uh, I, I knew that would happen. I just was, I was watching the cable slowly come out, but I had no tool to put it back in. Um, so, but data centers are difficult sometimes and EKS Anywhere makes that so much easier to say like, hey, we just need to adjust and, and treat this hardware more like a cloud provider. And it is still data center, it is still on-prem. So you can't completely treat it like uh, cattle or crops, as I like to say. Um, it is still a, a 
pets to some degree because we have MAC addresses and we have IP addresses. But uh, for the most part, yeah, it's it's a better way to install and maintain Kubernetes on-prem because if I want to do upgrades, I can change my spec and I can apply that and I can get a rolling upgrade of the cluster to say, hey, I want to go from 122 to 123. That's all that stuff. Uh, control plan, I think, is still coming, but worker nodes, I think, for bare metal. Um, it's coming, yes. I mean, yeah. It, it's, it's a much better way to operate Kubernetes than it is just to uh, deploy Kubernetes, because I can stand up Kubernetes without too much fuss these days, uh, but if I want to maintain it and, and run it for a large group of people long-term, like, that's a different story. So it looks like there was a follow-up on the multi-tenancy. Do you see that in there, Justin? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Thanks for posting this, Anis. Um, this was helpful. So if I'm not mistaken, this is in, this was around the previous question around, do we have multi-tenancy concept included in Tinkerbell workflows? Um, yes and no would be my answer, unfortunately. Um, so it depends on your network and where you're running your Tinkerbell stack, right? So if you have a machine that can cross uh, VLANs or can cross layer twos, um, then, then the Tinkerbell stack could answer to all of these kind of isolated networks. Um, but that's just one deployment option, right? There's other options. Um, you could have a single Tinkerbell stack per subnet or per layer two or per data center or per region. I mean, there's lots of options here. You can add more complicated things into the mix and use things like DHCP relay, which would allow you to house your DHCP outside of a layer two, and then you could serve multiple different subnets. Um, unfortunately, there's, I, I feel like there's not a good answer here, or at least I'm not giving a good answer about it. Um, but it would really depend on what, what kind of environment we're looking at. What are you trying to set up here? But um, Tinkerbell in general, yeah, it could it could respond to that. Um, but you do talk about like different uh, clusters being isolated from them. Um, th those are also very specific to your environment. Um, but but um, EKS anywhere at the moment with bare metal, it can only spin up a single management cluster. There will be future functionality to add um, workload clusters, workload cluster in terms of how cluster API defines them, um, but that unfortunately is not uh, supported at the moment. Right. And that's, yeah, right now they're self-managed or one-to-one -one management with, we have a cluster API running on the same cluster that was provisioned. And in the future, we'll have a single place to run those management clusters. We have that, we support that today with vSphere, uh, but for bare metal, that one's still coming. So, yep. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, if you want questions on EKS Anywhere, we have uh, the documentation I just posted. We have the Git repo, and then there's also uh, in the Kubernetes Slack. Uh, all the developers have worked um, crazy hard on on getting this running out the door. I'm just excited that I was able to show it off today. Uh, so uh, reach out to them if you uh, have any additional like comments on use cases, uh, open an issue on GitHub because that's probably the best place just to get started. But again, it is completely free to get started. It's open source. All of the components are open source. Uh, so you can run it today if you have a hardware or vSphere environment or just on your local machine. If you want paid support, absolutely let us know. Uh, we have paid support options. If you're running this as an enterprise with, you need an SLA for uh, any sort of workload uh, management that you're like, hey, this can't go down or I need to be able to call someone if this does go down, uh, I won't come to your house and push the buttons, uh, but we have a great support team that <laughs> yeah. will help in those cases. So uh, we went a little bit over, but I think it was a great show and I'm glad we got the cluster. The cluster itself only took took less than 20 minutes uh, if, if I didn't have power issues. Right. Um, so I don't know very many uh, places you can run bare metal from from powering on to an API server in 20 minutes. I apologize, Justin. Do you mind if I plug real quick a couple Tinkerbell things? Yeah. Awesome. So uh, the Tinkerbell open source project, we're in the CNCF Slack. Um, we've, we've got our own channel. Please do come over. Um, and real quick, Vipin talked about it being a microservice architecture, and if it's of any help or consolation, Equinix Metal has been running the majority of the parts of the Tinkerbell stack in production for a long time. There's, there is some definite stability here. You can provision thousands of machines, um, and 
it, it does have that, but it is still an early um, open source project in general. So thanks, Justin. Appreciate you letting me throw that in at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I was. I remember when Tinkerbell got announced, I was so excited. I was. This was like three jobs ago, and it was announced. <laughs> I'm like, I want to get rid of Cobbler. Please let me get rid of Cobbler. <laughs> right, right. I was right. very excited. So. All right. Well, um, I know we have some more videos. You can check out the channel on YouTube. Uh, Sai has the lightboard video. I have some shorts showing off different lights and things that I'm still programming on the box itself. Uh, so check it out. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to see uh, more stuff about EKS Anywhere, Bare Metal, or this box itself. So hope everyone has a, a great rest of your week and weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. All right. See Thanks. you all. Bye. Take care.